This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. ...was a densely packed warren, alive with the sights of snake charmers and fakirs, not to mention the overwhelming scent of communal Egypt. And in its environs, the past was always present. To the southwest, the fabled pyramids rose like ancient skyscrapers or man-made mountains that ruled the horizon. For centuries, Muslims, Christians, and Jews had forgotten the history of these massive stone peaks and had instead largely settled on one common explanation. These were the ancient granaries of the biblical patriarch Joseph. But not everyone agreed. More than one ruler believed that the pyramids covered stores of ancient gold. Once, a caliph from Baghdad had commanded his forces to attack the Great Pyramid. Another time, a ruler issued a decree to demolish the pyramids. Drillers and stonecutters spent eight months laboring to remove one or two of the mammoth stones each day, but then simply gave up, remaining, as one chronicler wrote, very far from accomplishing what they had set out to do. So the pyramids were largely left alone, but not so the Sphinx. When the Ottomans bequeathed their Egyptian empire to the care of the Mamelukes, these ruling custodians used its venerable face for target practice. Ironically, when the pyramids were opened in the 19th century, it was primarily Western adventurers who made off with the remaining spoils. Statues, mummies, paintings, and ancient stones were crated and bundled out of Egyptian ports bound for the capitals of Europe. By the time a young Winston Churchill arrived to paint the pyramids, their secrets had been largely unlocked and their treasures were displayed at the British Museum. Only the harsh terrain of shifting sands and the vast sky remained constant in this part of the world. At night, the huge stars shone brightly as they had for millennia. According to legend, the Milky Way glimmering overhead had been crafted to form the River Nile in the sky. Ancient priests believed it contained signposts to help the dead pharaohs navigate their way to the afterlife. But in 1943, to look up and see this pathway of stars was perhaps to be reminded not of the ancient legend, but of something else altogether. With World War II raging, the pathways to the afterlife were crowded. At a rate of one every three seconds, another human life on earth was being snuffed out. In Cairo, meanwhile, Westerners had arrived en masse once more. Just over a year before, German forces under General Erwin Rommel had reached El Alamein, 150 miles from Cairo, from where they planned to capture the Suez Canal and move north through British Palestine until they could link up with Nazi forces heading south from the Soviet Union. Instead, in a brutal battle, England's General Bernard Montgomery had forced them to retreat to the relative safety of Libya and Tunisia. It was the Allies' first major victory over the Germans and the first turning point of the war. Now the war had come to Egypt again. This afternoon it came with a terrific roar, a caravan of dark cars winding its way to the pyramids and the Sphinx. Inside were the key leaders of the Allied war effort, admirals, generals, doctors, and the two men, in whose hands lay the fate of Western democracy, Winston Churchill and Franklin Roosevelt. It was November 23rd, and a cool wind was blowing over the faint ripples in the sand. Taking a break from their Cairo summit, for the Allies this was to be the first of three separate rounds of discussions, and among the most important of the war, the leaders of the United States and Great Britain were sightseeing. The trip was Churchill's idea— his eyes flashing, his husky voice filled with warmth and humor, he was suffering from a cold. He was seized with his customary enthusiasm. When the Prime Minister had first proposed the idea earlier in the day over tea at the President's villa, Roosevelt was so taken by it that he tried to rise out of his chair, a rare lapse, only to painfully realize as he gripped the handles and his knuckles whitened that he couldn't. Mr. President, an insistent Churchill boomed, you simply must come and see the Sphinx and Pyramids. I've arranged it all. They drove over at sunset as the temperature dropped and the night shadows lengthened. To the east were the three pyramids on the plateau. 
and to the west was a royal cemetery containing over four thousand mummies. A local guide was procured at the last moment to help them find their way around, but it was the rich...